Welcome to Peds Doc Talk TV. I am Dr. Mona Amin, a board certified pediatrician and mom to a toddler. And on this video, we are talking all about baby containers or baby container syndrome. It's not a term I like, but it's probably one that you've heard. I'll explain what it is, why I don't like the term, and what we need to do in order to balance baby's development. This video is brought to you by the New Mom Survival Guide. It is an online digital e-course and community created by me where I talk about things like development, feeding, sleep, and so much more. If you are interested in purchasing the course, make sure you check the link in the caption section. Before we continue, make sure you hit that subscribe button because that's how you stay up to date on all of the videos I do here on Peds Doc Talk TV. And here we go. So what exactly are baby containers? So baby containers are any gear item, we can use the word gear, that restricts baby's free movement. It's something that we're putting baby in so that they're not on the floor practicing their motor skills or practicing different skills. So it's containing baby. Now, I think there are a lot of great containers on the market. There are some that I'm not a huge fan of, which I will go into why, but there are containers out there, quote unquote containers, that you can use, but it's really important to know when you should use it, how to balance it, but also know why from a developmental perspective, we don't want you to overuse this baby gear or baby containers. So baby containers are things like jolly jumpers, swings, walkers, bumbo seats. I mean, the list goes on and on, extra saucers. And I don't like the term baby container syndrome or baby containers because it can be met with a lot of judgment. For example, if a child is not meeting a motor milestone or if a child develops flattening in the back of the head, Immediately, there's, well, maybe you weren't picking up baby enough. Maybe you weren't engaging with baby enough. Maybe you weren't doing X, Y, and Z. And talk about guilt. That's not what this is about, right? Child development is a big picture thing. I have children who use container items very rarely and still develop flattening of the head. And then I have babies who are in container items all the time per parent and are not developing flattening of the head. So to start blaming parents and saying, well, you shoulda, coulda, woulda is not what I want for families and parents, especially in those infant years. The goal of this video is to explain why or why I don't like certain baby container items or baby gear. I'm gonna explain if you do use these items, best practices and how to balance it with other developments such as floor time, and also just a primer on motor development and floor time and the importance of floor time for babies and why I love it so much as a general pediatrician and developmental expert. So if you go back to the basics, Floor time is one of the biggest things that we can do for our child that is free and also promotes them to use their muscles. When a child is on the floor, so from infancy when we're talking about tummy time, and then they're going to sit, and then they're going to roll, and then they're going to crawl, and then they're going to pull to stand, and then they're going to walk. The impetus to use your big muscles is going to happen more when you practice. And when you're on the floor, you're going to feel like, hey, I need to move, and in order to move, I gotta practice and I gotta strengthen these muscles. Think about it from an evolutionary perspective. In olden times when we had no gear, nothing to hold our babies in, in order for the babies to follow their parents, they had to get up and move. They had to start crawling, they had to start walking, they had to start running, they had to start moving. And in order to provide that motor skill development, floor time is essential. So from a motor standpoint, remember, there are actually four major domains of development. We have motor, language and communication, social and emotional, and cognitive. So from a motor standpoint, floor time is the free and basic thing that we need to do to promote motor development. So that means tummy time, rolling, crawling, sitting up, pulling to stand, and walking. So ideally, floor time is going to be what you'd want to do with your child. But I love having them in these containers. I use some of them too, which I'll get into. But you really want to optimize the floor time use. How you can do this is get a play mat, put a play pen around it so that if they're starting to crawl or mobilize, they have a safe and secure area that if you're busy in the kitchen or if you're busy putting things away in the room, that they have a safe place to practice these motor skills. But what about all of these items on the market? Dr. Mona, they're telling me that it's great for my baby's development. Remember, it's all marketing. The best thing we can do for motor development is allow our child floor time or practice on the floor, playing with them, allowing independent play. All of these things are going to foster that motor development. 
when you're looking at purchasing items, you have to be wary because they'll say different ages. They'll say, you know, great for this development, but great for this. But remember the big concept of motor skills. The more a baby can practice on the floor, the more impetus they're going to learn to advance through those various motor skills. If we're spending more time in baby containers, then that's less time that they are practicing and using those big muscles or even those small muscles they need for gross motor or fine motor development. Now, using baby containers is fine in moderation, and I'll get into the ones that I'm okay with, but moderation is a very loose word, right? I'm sure you're like, well, moderation, what does that even mean? In my opinion, when you are using baby containers, if you feel like you are overusing it, you're probably overusing it. The goal with any of these items is that if you are purchasing a baby container gear item, that you are optimizing floor time as much as you can and really only using these baby container items for moments of convenience when you are cooking in the kitchen and you need them in the kitchen with you. These are the moments that I want you to use it. But when you're playing with your child, I want you to have them on the floor. When you are able to get a playmat and set up a playpen if they're mobile so that you can start allowing them that floor time practice. I think, you know, on the market, we tend to see all of these items. We're like, oh, I must have this and my friend has it, so I have to get it. You don't need anything. You don't need to purchase anything to foster your child's motor development. Even in infant development in general, all they really need is floor time and you to communicate and teach them things and some handful, maybe five to 10 different toys. You don't need every single item. You don't need every single gear item. That is not what's gonna reach developmental outcomes for your child. So very important to remember this. And as a reminder, I go through all of this in my new mom survival guide, which is a course available at my website, which I'm linking in the bio. There is so much baby gear out there. And in this video, I'm talking about things like baby bouncers, like the baby Bjorn, bumbo seats or sit me up seats, extra saucers, walkers, and jumpers. Now, this video is not sponsored by any of these companies, and I'm pretty sure some of these companies don't want me talking about their products because I don't agree with some of their products, but I wanted to be very open and honest about which ones I like, if you're gonna use it, when I would be wary of using it, and so much more. So first, let's talk about bouncers. I'm talking about the Baby Bjorn bouncer. This is actually a very popular item, and it's actually one that we use. The age is marketed from zero to two years, but also eight pounds to 29 pounds. Remember, it's important to look at the weight recommendations for the items you buy as well. But when you're purchasing it, even though it's saying that it's okay for eight to 29 pounds, you also want to think of, well, what am I using this for? And is it really needed? And that is very important when you're purchasing things like a bouncer. So pros. We actually did really love this item. One, it allowed us to put Ryan in a safe space when we were cooking. So rather than keeping him away from us, if he wanted to see us, and I like having children be introduced to cooking from a young age, so I would pull him in the kitchen, in the baby bouncer, and he would just watch us cook and watch us eat and watch us do all of that in the bouncer. I also like that it's not battery powered. You're gonna find that I don't enjoy or recommend usually items that are battery powered. Why is that when he was in the bouncer, he loved it. He was able to use his own force, own momentum to bounce. And it was very exciting for him. He would push back and forth and laugh and giggle. And the more he kept bouncing, the more he would want to keep pushing. So from a developmental perspective, I love this. Rather than a artificial thing that's swinging for them, the baby themselves is creating movement and momentum in this item. So cons about the baby Bjorn bouncer. Really one of the biggest things is if you are leaving your child in this too much, could they develop more flattening of the head? Now I mentioned earlier that flattening can happen for so many children regardless of the devices that a parent is putting them in. So you kind of want to monitor. Are you using this when your baby could be on the floor and practicing floor time? When you're using the baby Bjorn in best practices, it's important to remember that you are using it when you need it, when your child is not able to do floor time. For example, if you are in the kitchen and you are not able to set up a play area there, you can bring your baby in the Baby Bjorn Bouncer and watch them in the kitchen. Also remember never to use this item for unattended sleep. Ideally, I want you to be moving your baby into a safe sleep environment. So if your baby is falling asleep in this item, remember their neck is going to get like this and that's a safety concern. So you really have to have eyes on your baby at all 
times if you're going to allow them to sleep in it. So better to just not allow sleep in these items. And if you are, you got to be very, very careful from a safety perspective. So although this product is marketed from zero to two years, I really think it's important to take them out of this item once they are sitting or showing signs of sitting, because by that point, they really need to be doing more floor time. I don't mind this item in the infant years. We loved it. And we found a lot of joy. And so did Ryan from him bouncing in the bouncer. But once your child is sitting on their own, or even showing signs of those early moments of sitting. I would love for them to practice those skills on the floor, in a play area, on a play mat. And remember, you want to balance this product with the floor time. So ideally, you want to utilize floor time when you are able to and use the thing like a baby bouncer or baby Bjorn when you are not able to do floor time. For example, kitchen activities, when you really need them in the room with you and you can't set up a play area where you are at. Okay, now we're going to talk about the Bumbo seat and the Sit Me Up seat. Okay, I'm not a fan of either. Oh, I'm so sorry. So let's talk about the Bumbo seat first. So the Bumbo seat is marketed from three months to 12 months, but on the manufacturer's label, it says that your baby should also have adequate head control, which really may not happen for some babies until after four months of age. So you have to remember that age is not the only thing we should go by. We should also look at your child's development. Do they have head control? Because if they don't have head control, they shouldn't be using these items. The manufacturer does say don't use this item for prolonged periods. But remember, when we have these items, we can get used to its comfort and its ease and baby may seem to like it. But it's on you as the parent or caregiver to say, you know what? I have this item. I know that I'm not going to overuse it, but I like it just for a place for my baby to be. But really remember to balance it with other developmental activities such as floor time. So the sit me up seat is also another item that promotes baby in a seated position before they're ready. So now when you think about this, why are we forcing a baby into a position that they're not ready for yet? It's not going to teach them to sit up. I think there is a misconception that a bumbo seat and a sit me up seat is going to teach your baby to sit similar to like a walker, but that's not the case. Your child is going to learn how to sit while practicing on the floor tummy time, things like rolling, eventually sitting, eventually crawling, walking, all of those motor skills. So things like a sit me up seat and a bumbo seat are not actually really needed. They're not going to speed up your child's development. And in many ways they can deter it because if your baby is being forced to sit up right with these devices, they're not learning on their own accord how to develop those big muscles. They have become reliant on these things to help support them. Whereas if you are practicing with your baby on the floor, you are going to be able to see them figure out balance, figure out proprioception. Proprioception is where my body is in the space where I'm at. And they're not going to learn that if they're in a device or container. So if you're purchasing this because you think that your baby is going to sit up faster and that's the best way, no. Now, if you like these items because it allows your baby to sit somewhere, if you're going to feed solids, then go for it. But overall, I don't see a lot of pros with these two items. I think forcing baby to sit when they're not ready is not going to speed up sitting. And once they are sitting, they don't really need to have the support of a bumbo seat or a sit me up seat. So what are best practices of using these items? Best practices, in my opinion, is you don't need them. Now, if you're like, I really love it, Dr. Mona, I really, really love it, please make sure you practice floor time. Now, floor time is going to be allowing them on a play mat, putting rolled up towels by their hips, allowing them to feel how their body moves when they're not stable. They're going to gain more confidence and more strength by trial and error. And remember, my new mom survival guide has so many tips on infant development, including motor development, like sitting, rolling, crawling, and walking. So another issue with the bumbo seat and the sit me up seat is that it can put your baby in an abnormal position where their spine is more slouch and that's not optimal for development. And also it can tilt the pelvis in a way that is not great for their development either. When I say not great, it doesn't mean that if you used it, your child's harmed. It just means that are there other options? Do you really need to purchase this item or use this item? Probably not. Now there is a item on the market called the up seat. This is a newer item that provides a little more support on the back so it corrects that slouching issue. But I still wanna remind you though that I don't want you to use the up seat also to teach your baby how to sit. They are gonna to learn to sit by trial and error on the floor. The up seat can be a great example of something you would use if you're starting to puree feed and you want them in a secure place to feed. This is something that you can use versus the bumbo or the sit me up seat, which allows better pelvis location and also less of that slouching concern with the other two seats. 
Next up, we're talking about extra saucers. And we did use the extra saucer. We used the skip hop, which is one that we really like, but it was also short lived, similar to the bouncer. You're gonna find that I am all on board with some of these gear items, but I also, as a developmental expert, know how am I overusing these? When am I going to use it? And restricting it when I feel like it's being used too much. So pros of the extra saucer. Enjoyment. Really, your kid does like it. I mean, Ryan loved it. He would just stand in there and he would play with all the toys. There's a lot of lights. There's a lot of music. It's fun for them. But let's talk about the cons of extra saucers. We really did love the Baby Bjorn bouncer, but once he started sitting independently or showing more signs of sitting, we didn't want him using that bouncer anymore. So he was practicing floor time, but I wanted somewhere for him to be where I could also bring him into the kitchen and watch him. I didn't want to have to move the play area completely. It was actually much easier just to move the extra saucer and put him in there. So a con to remember is if the foot pad is not in the correct level or position, we don't want our child to be forced in tiptoe while they're playing because they're going to put so much pressure on their toes, which is not optimal for foot development, crawling, walking, pulling to stand. So if you're going to use it, you want to make sure that their foot is flat on the bottom level of the extra saucer. You don't want them to have to be tiptoeing to reach that. And remember, these extra saucers come with different levels. So you may need to lower it or raise it according to the height of your baby. So best practices for me in an extra saucer is use it when your baby has already started to sit independently. So extra saucers are marketed for four months plus. But remember, I want them to practice sitting skills on the ground. Once they have shown me that they can sit on the ground, then I'm okay utilizing things like extra saucers for convenience purposes or for enjoyment. It's really important to use the development of your child to guide the use of these products versus the age. I want you to wait because by then we can see then that they have proper core development. They've developed strength in their core by sitting. So now I'm not as concerned about using these devices, which would not allow for that development when they're in these items. Remember, the extra saucer is something that I'm okay with, but balance it with floor time. So how we used it, Ryan loved it, and it was so easy to put him in there. And then I would look at him, and I said, you've been in there too long. I had insight into understanding that it was probably we've been using it too long. There's no minute that's going to be like, hey, you can't use it more than 15 minutes. But if you're feeling, and you are smart, that, hey, this is something that I've been using too much today, you need to cut back and cut back and utilize your floor time. Create that safe space where it's just a play mat and a play pen so there's a barrier so that the child isn't crawling all over the place and out of your view so that you can allow that baby to practice those big motor skills. So the thing about using these baby containers and extra saucers, things like that, sometimes when we put them in these items, we can forget to interact. It doesn't mean that you have to interact with your baby all the time. Remember what I said, it's all about moderation and it's all about balance. But a way that you can use the extra saucer for language development is speaking and labeling and talking to what the baby is seeing in the environment and on the extra saucer. So if they're playing with the light, you can say the light turned on. You can say the blue rainbow. You can describe things that they're seeing and use language and communication while they're in the extra saucer. But overall, the big thing with the extra saucer is balance it with floor time, like I said, for all the other items. And remember to only start using it once your child has began to sit up on their own. To me, this is important, similar to other things that we're using, because we want to be able to use these items and balance it with normal childhood development as well. So this is not sponsored, but we really did like the Skip Hop 3-in-1 because it goes from an extra saucer where they're sitting inside to a place where they can pull to stand to practice to a table that they can play at. So I like that item because it's not just going to be used for just a short period of time. You're going to be able to use it as your child develops. But remember to take your child out of it when they are showing those motor skills like crawling and showing signs because we want to allow them the practice on the floor. They're not going to learn how to crawl in the extra saucer. Jolly jumpers. Okay, I know you've seen these. I'm sure you love them and your baby has a lot of fun in them. And so I get it. They look fun. But in my opinion, there is no need for a baby to jump like that. There is no need. They can jump on you. You can hold them and they can jump. But I don't really feel like there is a necessity for a jolly jumper. I also am concerned because I do believe that the momentum that they gain from jumping with that rubber band can put a little bit too much pressure on their joints. So overall, I am not a big fan of the jolly jumper. I get it. I get it. Okay, Dr. Mona, it's so much fun. So look, I understand if it's fun. But remember, if you do use it from a safety perspective, I mean, they're harnessed and I'm not concerned that they're going to fly out of that. But I am concerned that do they need that much pressure put on their hips and their joints? 
You can hold them and play with them here. You can utilize floor time, right? Use all the things that I mentioned. But my opinion is that the jolly jumper, the bumbo seat, and the sit me up seat are not really necessary. Save your money, save the headache, and use other items. Use the floor or let them jump on you. Whew. Okay, walkers. I know so many of you probably have used them. Now, I'm not a fan of walkers. There are two different types of walkers that I'm going to go into. One of them I'm okay with, but I'll explain when. The other one is a no-no for safety. The one that's a no-no is the one that should not be sold anymore, but maybe you've gotten it as a hand-me-down, but please just maybe don't use it, no need, is the one where your child is sitting inside. They're able to walk inside the walker, but they're inside a contraption, almost like an extra saucer that moves. So they're inside and they're rolling around. You probably have seen these from old videos from the 90s. The problem with this is that this is a safety hazard. Your child can roll over in them. Your child can roll down the stairs and also it elevates them just so slightly that they can pull on a dishcloth that's in the kitchen and bring a hot pot of water down. Safety wise, these extra saucers are not safe. We also see injuries in the hospital because of these walkers. So ideally, we do not want you using them. I'm going to put a big mm on using these types of walkers because there is no benefit of it. They're not gonna learn walking faster and there is a risk of using them. So most countries should have walker bans. Over 230,000 walker related injuries have been reported in the United States and over 90% of them were injuries to the head and neck. It is not worth it. This is not gonna help your child walk and when the risk is higher than the benefit, we don't support it and neither do I. So besides the safety concern, because I think that's very important to remember, Developmentally, going back to putting your child in a seated position before they're ready, using a walker is not going to teach your child how to walk. What is going to teach your child how to walk? Your child is going to learn how to walk by having the strength to do so, which they're going to develop by having floor time, the confidence to know that they can do this, balance and proprioception. These are the ways they're going to learn to walk. They get up, they fall. They're going to build confidence. They get up, they fall. They're going to learn about their body and proprioception. Okay, if I need to get here and I just stood up, okay, this seems very wobbly. Trial and error. They are going to learn trial and error from practicing on the floor, practicing pulling to stand, practicing on cruising on safe items. A walker is going to give them that false confidence that's not going to make them walk faster. So when can you use walkers? Now, I don't want the walker that you're sitting your child in. There are those push walkers. I'm sure you've seen this. There are many brands of this. I don't mind push walkers when your child has shown signs of some independent steps. Why is that we know that they have the strength. We know that they can now utilize all of this, but now we're giving them a little bit of encouragement and something fun to keep them excited. So using push walkers are okay once your child has shown signs of some independent steps. Remember also though, push walkers, they can go very fast. So you wanna make sure from a safety perspective, they're not near a staircase or that you have a barrier and rail for stairs. And you wanna make sure that you're balancing it with free time off of the walker. Free time where you allow them to stand, feel their balance, drop to the floor and try again. The more they do that, the more they're gonna learn that walking is not so bad. Walking is actually kind of fun. In order to keep up with my caregivers, I have to walk. So that is how they're going to learn it. So utilize this developmentally. If you get one of these push walkers, awesome. Store it away until your baby is showing signs of independent steps. And then you can take it out as a encouragement for baby, if you will. So bottom line of this video, I'm sure you got it. Floor time is amazing. Okay. Floor time is going to teach them a lot of motor skills without you really having to do much. You may have to guide them on teaching their body how to roll or giving them confidence or an applause or, you know, reinforcement, but they are going to learn so much motor skills by being on the floor. Number two, save your money on buying every gear that's being advertised for you. I'm trying to help you avoid the spend. If you can't afford these items, remember, you don't need any of these items. Your baby is going to develop and be fine on the floor. These are all items that are there for marketing. And that leads me to my third point. Remember that marketing is very, very sneaky. And I am aware of this as a pediatrician, as someone who does promote products on my page from time to time, but I'm very aware of how I present the information and also talking about benefit risk if there needs to be a discussion about that. 
But when you're buying an item and it says it's good for baby's development, I want you to really look at all of the things that they're talking about. For example, the extra saucer, it'll say great for cognitive development, great for language and communication, but it doesn't talk about motor, right? Putting your baby in an extra saucer is not going to develop their motor skills. Also, it doesn't talk about how language and communication and cognitive development is going to be even more developed with a caregiver with them, right? So it's really important to remember that nuance. You can buy these items, but you've got to remember the marketing and also the age ranges. Just because something says three months up, you really should go by the data that says, hey, what about my child's development? What are they doing? Is this okay for me to put my baby in a seated position if they're not really sitting yet? Why don't we practice sitting on the floor? If my baby is not walking yet, why am I going to use a walker, right? You want to use and remember all of those things when you're looking and purchasing items. Number four goes back to floor time. If you are using any of these items, balance is key. I can't tell you how much of what you're going to use, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. I think that's going to drive people crazy whenever I hear those recommendations. You need to have insight in saying, hey, look, I've been using this a little bit too much. Talk to your partner if you have one. Do you think we're using this too much? That is what we did in our family. If we're overusing screens or overusing an extra saucer, me and my husband will have a conversation and say, I think we're overusing it. How can we balance this more with floor time and other developmental activities? But also remember that these items can be good for your survival, but you can also create a playpen area. You can also put them on the floor on a playmat in that area. There are other options so that you can have a moment to put the dishes away or to make dinner, whatever you're doing, but also allow them a safe place to play. And number five is a big one. Do not beat yourself up if your child is not meeting a milestone and you used these devices. I know I'm telling you all the optimal practices, but the worst thing that we can do is say, I did this and this is why my baby now has this. I see babies who have a lot of floor time and go on to have motor delays. I see babies who parents say, yeah, we utilize a lot of container items and their baby has no delays. So it's not a causation situation, including with flattening of the head. It doesn't mean you use this and automatically your child's going to go on to develop a motor delay or have a flat head, but it's a correlation. Does overuse of these items lead to possibly delays in motor, flattening of the head, possibly a correlation? But there are so many other factors. Some children, just their own developmental trajectory is going to be delayed in walking. Some children just have very soft skulls. So even if their family's putting them in a bouncer chair for 10 minutes, compared to another child, they could still develop flattening. So I want you to drop that guilt. I know I talked to you about the benefits and risks and pros and cons of all of these items, but the number one takeaway is remove that guilt. So if you found this information helpful, make sure you share it on your social media channels. For more developmental content and education, check out my new mom survival guide, which I am attaching in the caption of this video. And make sure you subscribe to this channel to stay up to date on all of the future videos I'll be putting out here on Pete's Doc Talk TV. And I'll see you next time.